All right, hello everyone. Welcome back to our weekly tutorial sessions here on YouTube Live. I'm Chris at Duckle Network and I'll be the host for today. Uh, great, so um, something that we've been doing uh, new for the sessions here is we've been uh, sharing them through our blog kind of, um, you know, beforehand, uh, a week before to kind of give our users a chance to submit their questions uh, early so that we can uh, have some good content for you guys during the session. Uh, for this past week, we did receive quite a bit of questions, so we will be pulling from those blog submissions, but also feel free to submit your questions through the live chat uh, here on YouTube, and uh, we'll certainly pull from those as well. All right, so um, let's just go ahead and start picking from some of these blog questions. Um, and uh, just while I'm looking at that, uh, for those of you, of you that have been following along throughout the sessions, uh, you know, I did do some kind of cleanup of my uh, demo site here. There, you know, through the sessions, we had kind of built up quite a bit of uh, uh, kind of content there that wasn't necessarily useful. So I did clean that up a bit. All right, so we'll have kind of a, a fresh slate to go off of. Um, so one of the questions that uh, that we got through the blog was, uh, we have a user who's wanting to display the, the pricing on their products page, on their listing, uh, including you know the different decoration methods that they offer, but they don't want the price itself showing on that page. So first let's get our page configured to the same way that the user does, so we can understand exactly what the question is. So we're gonna come here into the page editor. I'm gonna configure my product listing widget. And actually we need to go back into my admin section. So right now my settings are defined globally, which is why I can't change them. So I'll go into admin products. And then from the products menu, I'll choose blank product display. Uh, so it's these two sections here. Now we do have the option to allow the store to customize that, which is when these fields would be opened up for me to change. But since I do have that disabled, uh, I have to make the change globally. All right, so let's just make it globally. Let's say uh, we're choosing option three. So this is the display uh, that we're gonna see. We're gonna see uh, each of the decoration methods that a product supports. And then next to that, the piece price. Uh, so the price for one piece using that method, okay? So let's save that change and we can go back to our products page and refresh to see that change. All right, again, I'll come back to my page, page editor and I do need to enable showing prices. So I'll show them below. So those are gonna show right below my product names. And you can see that's the layout uh, that we're after right now. So what this specific user is asking for, they still want those links to show for full color printing, embroidery, screen printing, and blank. Uh, what they don't want is the from uh, and then the price next to it, right? So they want to eliminate that price. Uh, so I, you know, we did want to cover this option uh, because this isn't actually something that that we have the the option to disable. Uh, through the options for the design listing widget, but it is something that uh, you can perhaps adjust using some custom CSS. So you know, quite a few of the questions that we did get submitted through the blog are ones that would require more uh, technical customization. So you know, today's session might kind of focus on that. We'll see how, how we go with the other questions, but so we're gonna cover some alternative ways to make site customizations when you know it's an option that isn't built into the system all right so we've got the the page set up just how we want it so let's go ahead and save and publish that change um, so through our youtube channel you know we do from time to time post walkthroughs or how to's on on different topics uh, what we're going to cover today on, on this question here is similar to some videos that we had shared in the past related to making CSS customizations 
to your Deco Network website, you know, specifically, let's say you want to hide a certain element, uh, which is kind of what we're doing here, or you want to change, you know, the color of a certain element. Um, so those types of questions were, were a lot more common before we uh, revamped the Deco Network page editor. There's a lot more customization that you can do now through the page editor that you had to revert, uh, resort to custom code for previously. Um, but you know, every now and then you are going to run into cases like this one where you are looking for something very specific that um, you know we're not going to have that option for. Um, but it's certainly possible through through further customization. All right, so I've published the change. Let me go ahead and uh, pull it up here on my live site now. Uh, and so essentially what we're going to do is we're going to use the uh, inspect or the development panel in my browser. I'm using Google Chrome here, but most of the uh, up-to-date browsers now have a similar tool, including um, Firefox, uh, Microsoft Edge, right, uh, as well as Safari if you're on a Mac. So to open up that panel in Chrome, uh, you can right-click essentially on an element that you might want to make a change on. So we know we want to hide this from and then the price next to it. So what we could do is we could right click on that section, choose the inspect option, and it's going to open up this panel down here at the bottom of our site, uh, which essentially is going to show, show us the structure that makes up the website. Uh, it's going to show us the structure, which we can then use to hide some of that information. All right, so the specific user that asked this question is looking to hide, uh, keep the links, but hide the, the price, right? So, uh, and I'll share some, you know, th this type of customization that we're doing, you know, again, it does get pretty technical. It does require some knowledge in this area. Um, I'll try and kind of summarize it, but there's a lot more in-depth tutorials that you can find online. Uh, a lot of great resources. Um, let me see if I can pull one of those up for you guys. So w3schools.com is a good resource for kind of general uh, general web development information uh, from topics like HTML, CSS, uh, JavaScript, you, know, you name it as far as web development and they kind of have information, reference guides, uh, tutorials, things like that. So definitely a great resource if you are interested more on this technical side uh, of the customization for your site. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back here. Essentially what we're going to do is build out some CSS rules that are going to hide that content that we're looking to hide. And CSS rules, as far as your Deco Network website is concerned, are applied back into your website's uh, edit website menu. So if you go under edit website, you'll find the option for your template CSS. If we open up that page, Okay, so once you open up that page, uh, you'll get essentially an input field, which is going to accept CSS rules. Any content that you want to apply as far as CSS is going to be pasted into this section. You'll want to make sure to enable it if it is something that you're going to be using. So you'll enable the custom CSS, and then you can start pasting in your rules. So the rules are something that you have to uh, you have to write, right? You have to come up with that logic to do uh, to tell the website you know, hide this or show this, change the color of this, so on and so forth. So let's try and again, build out that uh, that rule to hide the prices. So each of these um, items that you see in this section up above, uh, currently we're looking at the elements section of this development box in my Chrome browser. So each of these rows represents a structural element in the HTML for the website. Um, and for the most part, a lot of these elements have identifiers called classes. So a class is kind of a, a name that you give to a type of element. And that the classes are how we can identify those products. I'm sorry, those, uh, those elements when it comes time to writing our CSS. 
So either classes or you'll notice some elements uh, have IDs like this one up here. So an ID is unique to one specific element, whereas a class is shared possibly um, throughout several different elements, right? Each time that we see a direct to printing price, a DTG price, it shares that same class. Uh, whereas the ID, you know, that element is the only one that has that specific ID. Okay, but we, we can go ahead and use the class in this case. So what we're looking to do, uh, we're looking to hide any text that's not the link inside of that, um, these elements here inside of the uh, Deco Network product prices section. So this is really the, the target that we're looking to, uh, to identify. So let's start there. Um, on the right hand side is where we can start to build out the CSS rules. You can press the plus icon here to start building out a new rule. And in this case, Chrome's going to kind of help me out. It's going to give me the classes for the element that I have selected on the left hand side. All right. Um, I don't want this to end up being too specific, so I'm going to get rid of that first class, the uh, Deco Network grid text. I'm going to leave just Deco Network product prices. All right, so that's my starting point. Uh, we could do an example here, and let's say I wanted to hide that section altogether. I can apply a property like display none. And I'm sorry, it looks like that locked up on me. There we go. Uh, let's see, let's try editing it here. All right, so I can apply a property uh, display none to that element. And you can see it's gone ahead and hidden all those uh, away from my page. Um, but in this case, we want to target some sub elements of that. So we're going to continue adding on to uh, what's called the selector, right? The target of these properties down here. So let's kind of continue looking at the structure here on the left hand side and see how we can identify exactly what we need to get rid of. All right, so we've identified our starting point, Deco Network product prices section. Uh, within that, we have these uh, div div elements. We've got four of them, one for each process and then one for the blank. And then what we're looking to hide is contained within that. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, add that structure to it. So we'll add a div into our selector. Uh, and the way that selectors work is uh, we'll call these essentially um, phrases. So each of these phrases separated by space means you're drilling deeper down into, uh, into the tree. You'll notice here on the elements section, it's all kind of uh, indented in. As you're going deeper into the HTML, it's kind of like a tree, right, where it branches off and you get deeper into that hole that you're looking into. So by placing a space here between the Deco Network product prices and the div, we're saying we're going one element deeper and we're now looking for this type of element within that section. Okay, uh, and then really what we're looking to hide the text in that. So I think we've got our target locked in. Um, but we don't necessarily want to hide it, right? Display is not the property we want to apply. Um, we want to hide the text. So the easiest way to do that would be to set our font size to zero. Uh, and you can see it has that desired effect of eliminating the text, but leaving the link. So the link uh, has its own font size that's being set separately. So that is not affected by our, the rule that we've just written. Uh, but the text within that does not have its own you know, specific rule. It's just going off of the global font size. So by setting this rule here, uh, we're kind of overriding that global font size and telling the system to hide that text. So what we can do at this point is copy that, uh, that rule that we've built. We can come back into our customized template CSS page and paste that in. I'll just remove our test rule there. Uh, and the last thing would be to save and publish that change.
All right. Um, so while that's publishing, a couple things to mention. Uh, you know, we're doing this at the site level. So if you are on a multi-store plan uh, and you want to apply this change across, you know, several of your stores, uh, that snippet that you've pasted into your website's template CSS section, you'll need to repeat that process for each store where you want to apply that change to. Okay. So at this point, I could go ahead and close that uh, separate section of my, uh, my browser there. I can just refresh the page and without having to go back and uh, apply that change, it should already be live because it's, it's pulling in that custom CSS that I've brought into my site. Okay, so if I click into the product, um, you know, we haven't removed any functionality by doing this, so pricing is still gonna show um, once we get to this page, we've only removed that uh, here from the listing page. All right, so that takes care of uh, the first question there uh, through the blog. Let's see, we had a, a couple other kind of similar questions that uh, might require some of this type of change. So let's try and find those and see if we can't kind of group them together into a, a section for you guys. Okay, so there's one other question. Uh, it's not related to the uh, the website customization. It's more related to something that we have covered before, but not uh, not for this specific purpose. And that is the email and order templates. So someone has a question regarding their uh, their proof, or let's say the the invoice template. Uh, and they're mentioning that the the preview that's included in there, uh, it's kind of low re low resolution, right? They want it bigger so that the customer has a, a better view of what what's being quoted to them, uh, so that they can make a better decision as far as you know moving forward or any desired changes. Um, so let's jump into that. So we're going to kind of move a, away from the site here for a second. Okay, so for this, I'm gonna jump into uh, our Deco Network help system real quick. Um, I will mention, we do have a few articles that go in depth into um, which placeholders you can pull in to your email and order templates that allow you to customize the content that you're gonna display there. And specifically, I recall we have some available which allow you to pull in some light, larger image sizes for your mockups. So let's go in and have a look. Just going to search for a variable here and sure enough there's the order template variables description article and this is a list of all of the different placeholders that are available to you when you're customizing your order template so there's a lot here a lot of these are already included in the template right that default template includes things like your you know pulling in your customers information your information your logo things like that so a lot of it is already there but some of these fields have additional options which aren't included um, in the, the default template. For example, your, uh, your screen thumbnails, if you're using the screen printing process, the image that's used to kind of depict a screen, uh, by default, it's using a 300 by 300 pixel image, but we have those as large as 1000 by 1000 pixels. So you could kind of swap out that placeholder and that means your template's not gonna use that larger resolution image. Uh, same goes for the view, which is really the one that we're gonna be looking at today. The view is the, um, essentially the mock-up, right? That's the blank product with the design on it. Uh, so that's really what the customer is describing when they say, you know, the, the mock-up proof. Um, again, by default, we're using a 300 by 300 pixel image. 
uh, but we offer up to 600 by 600. So we can double the size of that and gain a bit more resolution. Okay, so we found the information that we're looking for. We can come back to our email and order template section. I'll go in and I'll say edit next to my order template, which is used for my quotes as well as my orders and invoices. And I'm gonna jump into the customized template section. All right, let me just, uh, I'm gonna start fresh here. I'm gonna copy in the default template. All right, and then we're gonna look for this same variable. That's the default one, view image URL 300. That's the default placeholder that pulls in that 300 by 300 pixel image for my mockups. So here it is about uh, three quarters down in the template. And all I really need to do is swap out 300 for 600. So I've changed that placeholder from view dot image underscore URL underscore 300 to view dot image underscore URL underscore 600. All right, uh, and that's all, all that's required here in this case. I can go ahead and save that change. And let's see, we can pull it up. I'm not sure if it's really gonna be visible over the, um, the YouTube live here, but um, we can at least double check the, the image to make sure it's pulling in that larger, that larger view. All right, let me just pull up a test order here that should have a mockup. This one should have it. And we can do view as customer to check that out. Okay, so here's the, the quote mockup. If we scroll down here, uh, you can see right away, actually, you know, it's a much larger image than uh, you would normally see here. Uh, so it has uh, doubled in size. We could just double check here, um, check the image. If we right click and say image open, uh, open image in new tab, you can see Chrome lets me know that's a 600 by 600 pixel image. So again, we've doubled the size of that mockup so it can appear larger on, on the uh, order sheet. Okay, so that's kind of a quick customization that you can do uh, to, your, to your order template if you do want larger mockups. Again, we do go up to that 600 by 600 size. All right, uh, that question came in from Jim. So Jim, hopefully that helps out. Uh, and then on that previous question, that was from Kaylin. So Kaylin, hopefully that uh, that website customization option helps you with hiding the prices from your listing, but keeping them on your product page. All right, uh, I'm gonna keep pulling in from, uh, from these blog questions. Um, so that was it for the customization side. Uh, you know, we did touch on some website customization, uh, which can be generalized. So what we covered as far as the step for identifying what that selector needed to be, um, you know, that same idea you can apply to other things that you're looking to change, other parts of the system that you might be looking to hide, or let's say change the font size for, change the color for. Um, I will uh, stress, you know, leave those types of customizations as kind of a last resort. Again, the, the web page editor gives you so much flexibility. You wanna use that as much as you can so that you don't have to worry about the custom code. But uh, you know, if it is something that definitely is not offered, you do have that code access. Uh, so why not take advantage of it? Okay, so again, we're moving off of customizations now. And uh, we've got a question from Gary who wanted to know about pricing. So, you know, he's looking into, he's still during his setup process. So he has questions about um, pricing. He's not sure, um, you know, what all the variables are that he needs to consider when setting up his pricing. What's the easiest way to set it up? He, you know, he just wants to make sure that during the setup, he's doing it the right way from the start. Um, so I, I definitely understand where, where you're coming from, Gary. Um, we'll definitely jump in and take a look and I'll give some recommendations, you know, based on what I typically see, 
uh, what's the most successful type of setup for your uh, your decoration pricing. Okay, uh, and then Gary does have a follow-up question as far as uh, Business Hub. Uh, he mentions uh, right now they they use kind of a coloring system to uh, to identify orders. Uh, I'm guessing through through the production cycle, um, and he's wondering if there's any any improvements uh, that can be made there, or, or just looking for general ideas on that. Okay, so yeah, let's jump in. Um, so to get into the pricing, uh, you're going to go into your admin section. You're going to choose decoration processes, and there's going to be a section down at the bottom of that list for decoration pricing. Uh, so this is something that we cover uh, for our new signups. We do jump on this page uh, during uh, the initial session that we, we walk them through the system. We cover this section here and give some insight as far as what the options are, but uh, you know, it can be pretty uh, in depth. So there's a lot to look at here. So, you know, I'll go ahead and kind of break it down. Uh, in terms of what I would recommend, um, you know, we'll run through each of the processes here and, and give some feedback as to what I typically see. Um, I will mention a lot of this does have to do uh, with variables specific to, to your business. So I, you know, it's not going to be possible for me to give a formula here that's going to work for every business or, you know, that's, I could guarantee is going to be successful pricing for you. Um, but based on my knowledge of the processes and again, what I see uh, across different customers and the way that they're doing it, um, you know, I'll give feedback based on that. So essentially what I'm getting at is I can't tell you what to set your prices to, uh, but I can kind of lead you down the path of what might, uh, might work best in terms of which method to use uh, or which variables to consider. All right, so as far as variables, you know, this goes for all the processes. Really what you want to consider, um, which a lot of people do kind of forget, you know, they think more on, on terms of profit, right? How much do, do I want to make from this process? And oftentimes we kind of leave behind, um, you know, your cost. How much does it actually cost me to, uh, to run that machine, to have someone operating that machine, to run the shop? You know, things like that. So those are the kind of variables that you want to take into consideration when you're thinking about pricing. Uh, you want to make sure that your price is going to, you know, definitely cover your running cost. Uh, you know, again, the staff, the machinery, the shop, all of that. Uh, and then on top of that, once you've figured out kind of the baseline, you know, where do I break even as far as, uh, you know, running these jobs and the cost for me to, to run the jobs, uh, now you can start looking at profit beyond that. So how much do you do you want to uh, earn beyond that yourself? How much do you want to be paying your employees? Um, and then, you know, what kind of profit do you want for the business itself? Uh, so again, those are the variables that you want to be looking at. Uh, now, in terms of applying that down into Deco Network, uh, what you're looking at uh, are several different pricing methods that we offer. Um, the one that I see most commonly, and this goes across the board, is a price table. Um, the reason being a price table is going to give you a lot of flexibility to set uh, quantity breaks, which are you know really common and really important in the decoration industry, right? People are, are used to uh, getting price breaks when they order large quantities, so it, it's kind of expected. Um, other Pricing methods that we offer, like uh, single price, don't give you that flexibility of, of quantity discounts. So uh, whatever price you set here, using a single price method, is going to apply regardless of the quantity being ordered. So you know, if someone's ordering one shirt and you're charging $10 for the print, that's fine. But uh, if they're ordering 100 shirts uh, and you're still charging $10 for the print, you know, they, they might have an issue with that. Okay, so uh, yeah, definitely price table uh, is what I would recommend. Uh, and even within price table, there are different options that you can choose. 
right? So let me go into my price tables for DTG printing. And let's just add a new table so that we can see what those options are. So when you're creating a price table, uh, you can use either standard pricing, which is going to differ from process to process, uh, each process having its own kind of um, specifics and needs that need to be met. Um, for example, DTG's standard pricing is going off of print locations. So um, first print location, second print location, third print location, so on and so forth. A uh, process like embroidery with standard pricing is going to use stitch count. So number of stitches in the design are going to be counted, and you're going to set your breaks according to stitch count. So let's say uh, zero to a thousand stitches is a certain price. A uh, thousand to four thousand stitches is another price, so on and so forth. Uh, and then screen printing is going to be based on number of colors. So right with screen printing. Uh, each color is a separate screen, um, and so the price is going to differ based on you know, how many colors are in the design determines how much uh, cost there is to actually set up and run the job and things like that. So screen printing's standard pricing is number of colors. Okay, uh, but beyond those standard, uh, those standard pricing methods for a price table, we also offer area-based pricing. Uh, and area-based pricing is, um, you know, it's super flexible for processes uh, like DTG, like sublimation. Uh, if you are kind of reusing a process for something like vinyl, even though we don't support it, uh, it's definitely useful there as well. Um, you know, at the basic level, we do offer it as kind of a standalone uh, pricing method. You can use area pricing. And really, it's just a calculation of square inch. So our system's able to take a look at all of the graphics included on a product, calculate out the square inch, and that could either be uh, the square inch area of just the graphic itself, so excluding any transparent parts of the image, or you could uh, actually draw a box around the entire design and calculate the square inch area of that box, that rectangle. Um, so whatever way you choose, you know, the system's calculating that square inch area and then charging a per square inch price. Um, okay, um, but on the price table side for area pricing, uh, there's different three different options that you can choose. Um, so the first one is looking at square inches based on how many areas you've used. So um, let's say you've only used one area. Uh, you might have a certain price. Once you start adding areas, your square inch price might go down, right? Because they're they're kind of decorating more, so you might give them a break and, and bring that price down. Uh, the other two options are going to be uh, flexible in terms of giving breaks to your customer based on the size of the graphic. So uh, the first option would be if you want to have ranges of sizes and then assign prices to that range. So for example, you might have uh, a range like if the design is from 0 to or 0 0.1 to 10 square inches, I want the price to be $10, right? So it doesn't matter if it's 2 square inches or 6 square inches. If it falls within that range, it'll be $10. Uh, otherwise, the third option here, you can still set those ranges, again, 0 to 10 square inches. Uh, but then the system is going to take a look at a per square inch price. So from 0 to 10 square inches, my per square inch price is 50 cents. Uh, and then from 11 to 20, it's 40 cents, right? So a range and then an associated per square inch price. So there is, like I said, a lot of flexibility with the price tables. Um, for processes like embroidery and screen printing, uh, for those two, I definitely recommend sticking with the standard pricing, um, right? Because it is uh, so specific to those processes, stitch count and number of colors. You know, that's something really re unique to embroidery and screen printing that you really want to take advantage of that functionality. But for processes like DTG printing, um, you know, an area-based price table uh, would be uh, really beneficial for you to be able to identify um, you know, what, 
how much you're going to charge based on the coverage that you're laying down. Um, you know, certainly your your running costs are going to be the same, uh, whether the design is, um, you know, four square inches versus 20 square inches in terms of you still have to uh, run the electricity to that machine. You still have to have someone operating that machine, load the shirt, unload the shirt, all of that. Um, but, you know, you're, you are using a little bit less material in terms of consumables on, on the ink and that side. So uh, it does give you that flexibility to create competitive pricing, right? Charge um, a low rate for lower designs and charge a higher rate for the higher designs. Um, again, it, it, it's all going to be a balance in, in terms of figuring out what your costs are and, and what you want to mark up on top of that for your profit and uh, both on your end and, and on the business end as well. All right, so hopefully that uh, that gives some kind of starting points for you on the, the pricing side. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna jump into some questions that we have here from the live chat. So, um, Dustin was asking if it's possible to change a transparent background to gray. Uh, I'm not sure which, uh, which background you're referring to, Dustin. Uh, if you could kind of follow up and clarify, um, we can go ahead and address that for you. All right, Brian's asking, can the colors of an account or quote page sent to the customer be changed by CSS? Um, so he's having an issue with uh, items on the purchases section uh, being grayed out and the customer doesn't know that they can click on it. Um, so I just want to make sure I'm understanding. Um, are you referring to the quote screen that we looked at earlier, Brian? Um, this section here? Again, I'll ask to for clarification there. I'm not 100% sure that I know which uh, which section you're talking about. So if you could clarify as well, uh, we'll go ahead and jump back onto that one. Okay. Uh, and then uh, Eve submitted a question uh, through um, the chat as well. She's mentioning that rounding, uh, she's had some issues with rounding on her side and it hasn't been working is that something that you could customize with css so um, that's not something that you could customize with css rounding is really a system function um, so there's no way to affect that through through uh, css code um, but it should be working um, so we can quickly touch on rounding and, and how it works and kind of set the expectation of uh, what you should be seeing so if, uh, if I take a look at my site here and I jump into price settings, which is where you configure rounding, uh, I'll just give an overview again of um, how it's meant to work. So the, the rounding that you're gonna see on your sites based on what you configure here is visual only. Uh, and you're setting number of cents to round, uh, round up to. So the system's rounding up to the nearest um, either one cent or you know, five cents, 10 cents, whatever you set here, it's rounding up that many cents depending on what, what the price is, right? So um, let's say your price is a dollar six and you have round price to 10 cents. So that price will change to a dollar 10. Uh, most of the time when people are doing rounded uh, prices, it's because they want their prices to go up to a whole dollar amount. Uh, so if that is the case, you want to round up to 100 cents, right? That way, regardless of what the price is, it could be a dollar one or a dollar 99. It's going to round up to, to that next whole dollar. 
So you want to set 100 cents if you're looking to round up to the next nearest dollar. Uh, and then uh, kind of in conjunction with that, a lot of people then turn on the drop to 0.99 option. So these two in conjunction with each other uh, work pretty well. Um, it would give you prices like, you know, 23.99, 19.99, um, which, you know, depending on what you're after might, might be kind of a marketing uh, type of benefit that uh, you want to see on your site. So if you do want to set it up that way, um, it's, you know, round price to a hundred cents and then drop to 99 and that'll take care of it for you. Otherwise, Again, you can change this value to whatever you want. I've seen people set that to 50 cents so that all of their prices are either, you know, 1050 or the whole dollar amount. If it was above the 50, then it'll round to, to the dollar and so on, so on and so forth. All right, so hopefully that clears it up on, um, on the rounding side. All right, uh, we did get clarification here. Um, Dustin was talking about the order template. Um, let's take a look. So I think I, I know what you're talking about, Dustin. You're talking about this uh, checkerboard pattern here that you see used for the screens. Uh, I believe that that should uh, be possible to change. Uh, I can quickly jump in and take a look. Yeah, so that checkerboard is not part of the image. Uh, the image is actually a transparent image. Um, as far as where that checkerboard is being applied, uh, I'll have to come in here and have a bit of a look. Okay, so yeah, it's, uh, it's actually a separate image that's being applied to, um, to the background there. So, um, you could potentially apply some CSS to your order template. Let's say you wanted it to be a, a gray background. Um, yeah, that's fine. Let's say a dark gray or maybe light gray. Okay, so you could copy that CSS. Uh, you might, you know, screenshot that and uh, try and use that yourself. So you could copy that. If you did want to apply that back to your order template, you'll go into order templates edit your order template, go into the customize section, uh, and then you'll place it into a style block at the top of your template. So you would need to type in style type equals text slash CSS. Uh, when you do need to close that uh, element, and then you can paste in your CSS within that. Okay, so something like that, save that off, uh, and that should get us some gray backgrounds instead of the uh, the checkerboard. Let's just refresh, double check, and sure enough, there it is. So we can reload that uh, customer view, and we still have that gray background. Okay, um, and then uh, Brian's follow up. He's actually talking about the the customer account area. So when the customer logs into their account area. He was having some issues on that. So we can take a look there. So let me jump into that customer account area. Okay, um, I think he was talking about the purchases section. So maybe you're talking about how these are alternating. Some are showing gray and some are white. Um, so we, we do have the option to uh, customize that uh, CSS section. Let me just double check. Um, I'm not sure if it's, it's accessible at the moment. Let me just double check. Yeah. So it's actually in the same section where we went earlier for the front end customization. It's under edit website, customize template CSS. And then from, from that page, you're gonna see a, a sub tab for the customer account area. Uh, I will mention this will only work if your website is using one of the new Deco Network 8 templates. If your website is using one of the older um, Deco Network 7.5 or, or earlier templates, 
you won't have access to the customer account area CSS section. So uh, you do have to be using one of the new templates. Uh, and this works just like the other section that, uh, that I described. Uh, okay, so, so again, getting at Brian's question. I think he's talking about this button here, which I don't have accessible here on my testing site. Um, now, this section, while while we do open up the CSS uh, to go in and you know paste your own, it's not as um, the structure of it isn't really built out for a lot of customization. So you're going to have a, a little bit harder time identifying your selectors. To I you know let's say I want to change the the button color for this. You can see there's really no class to kind of identify that's the items button. Um, so you, you will have a little bit of harder time. It may take, um, you know, someone with a little bit more expertise to help out with identifying that. I could give some feedback as to, you know, some workarounds that you can use when you're trying to create a, a selector for an item that doesn't have a specific class to easily identify it. Um, one of the ways you can do it is um, using the CSS uh, child selector. So you can at least identify, let's say, the section where your where your element is, right? So it's under DNU header actions. So I'm starting there, but then within that, um, you know, let's say I want to select the second uh, div element, but it has no really identifier um, identifying class. So rather than trying to input another class, I could put in the div element, and then I can use uh, colon nth, uh, nth child, and then input in parentheses the, the number that it, uh, it is within that element. So it's the second child, the second child element within uh, DNU header actions. Uh, and then let's just try setting like a background color or something. Uh, so this is one possible workaround when you're trying to do those more um, harder to find uh, selectors. You can use nth child. That's one option. Uh, another thing, if you are targeting links, you can go based off of the URL. So let's say I wanted to change the, the color of the items link. Uh, again, I'll add a, a new rule there so you can target the, the A element, which is a link. Uh, and then in brackets, you can do uh, essentially the property there for the link, H R E F, and then just put in its value. So equals quote slash user slash line underscore items. Okay, and you can target it based on that, that property. So uh, you could say color green. Okay, or let's try color white so we can actually see it. Okay, so those are two possible options, uh, you know, workarounds because this customer account area isn't structured out as uh, as uh, well as the website for customization, but uh, definitely some customization that you can bring in. Okay, so hopefully that one covers it, Brian. Um, and cool, looks like we uh, we did get to uh, Eve's issue with the rounding. Okay, uh, and then Dustin has a question on price tables, how to use different ones when quoting. Um, so that's not something that you can change at the, the quote level. You can't say, you know, this quote uses one price table and, and this quote uses another. Um, what you can do is have different products use different price tables. So I can definitely show that. Uh, if I jump into the product section of, a, of my admin, let's choose my second product here. And if I go into configure it, I can jump into pricing. And next to my decoration price, I've got a configure icon. I can click on it and I can switch that product to advanced pricing that then gets this link to show where I can edit price. 
uh, once I'm editing the price, I can uncheck uh, a specific process, like let's say screen printing from using the default pricing. And that's gonna open up a dropdown where you can select from your different price tables or a different pricing method. All right, so you can definitely override it at the product level. You can also override it at the product group level or product default. Um, so for example, I have three products under web store apparel. If I want to change the pricing on just those three items, I can edit that group and I can go into decoration pricing. I can say specify custom decoration pricing. Again, for screen printing, I can uncheck use system prices and that's going to open up that drop down where I can select a different price table. All right, so price table changes are going to be, uh, uh, you're going to need to make those at the product or product group level. Um, and then, you know, as far as the quote, you'll bring those in based on which products you've added. So you might have a, a Gildan 2000 wholesale and a Gildan 2000 retail, and each one of those uses a different price table. Okay, I do want to make sure to get to everyone's questions here. So let me just double check the blog and make sure we got everyone's question there. Okay, so yeah, looks like we got everyone. Uh, there is one newer question on, on the blog here uh, from someone who's still working on setting up their web store. Uh, they were just wanting to remove um, okay, so they were actually looking to remove the the link to their website when they're sending out quotes manually through Business Hub because their web store is still being set up. Um, so what I would actually recommend in that case, um, you know, don't worry about modifying your your emails that are going out because there's too many that are going out. Uh, rather than trying to change each of your email templates to remove the link, you know, leave the link, but what you can do is change your site so that it's not accessible while you're still building it out. The easiest way to do that uh, is to go in manage your site. Uh, if you're on a one store plan, I believe that's going to show under... I think it's going to show under the website section. So if you go under website, uh, if you're under uh, multi-store plan, it's going to be websites. Then you're going to choose customer options from the menu. And the one I'm get, going to recommend is um, customers must be logged in to view the website. So you can turn that on and you can switch it to a generic password. So whatever password you enter here uh, is going to be required in order to actually view the site. So your end customer can still click in and um, and uh, view the uh, the site, but they'll have to have that password if they actually want to go in and start navigating it. Okay, so that's definitely one option. Um, the other option I would recommend, um, which doesn't apply if you're uh, if the site that you're talking about is your main site, but if you are using an affiliate site. The other option that you have is to implement a redirect. So if you manage a secondary site, again, this won't work on your primary one, but uh, you'll go into administration and then you'll choose redirection. And so that will allow you to redirect that site, let's say to your main site or somewhere else so that whenever someone tries to visit that page, um, you know, they'll get redirected or they'll get sent somewhere else. Uh, and you can keep that redirect while you're building out the site uh, and then remove it once you're ready to take it live. Okay, so I think we just, uh, we got just about everybody's question answered. Uh, we are out of time for today. So I do want to thank everyone who uh, submitted questions. Lots of great questions in there. We did cover some more technical topics today, but I think, um, you know, they are beneficial and we did uh, kind of help out a, a few users there by tackling those uh, those harder topics. Uh, so do join back in with us next Wednesday. We're here on YouTube Live every Wednesday, uh, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. And uh, I do want to highlight uh, if we do have anyone tuning in who's not yet a Deco Network customer, uh, 
we do recommend going into our deconetwork.com site, booking a tour with one of our reps. They'll walk you through the system. They'll show you, um, you know, what's the the business hub, the order management system like. What what can you expect uh, in terms of benefits for your shop? They'll walk you through that entire process uh, and see if it's a good fit for you. All right. So again, thanks for joining in, and we'll catch you guys on the next one. Take care.